but it has so been the stop the watching Fox or CNN or whatever you watch with Fox News. Thank you. Great. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another episode of TRD Talks Live. Um, if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do that. All of these videos will be hosted there. All of the past videos are hosted on our YouTube channel. So please do go on there and subscribe. And if you do appreciate the kind of work that we do at The Real Deal, the kind of people we interview, the kind of news that we bring to you, please make sure you go to therealdeal.com and subscribe to The Real Deal so we can continue to bring you the kind of news and information that we do. For example, today we have an amazing guest for you. This is not the type of guy that you see normally speaking at conferences or on CNBC or other places like that. He's a very low-key guy, and I'm very happy to have him here today with us. George Gleason, the chairman founder and CEO of the bank OZK. I know there's a lot of people who are watching this program and they're thinking they're special. But let me tell you something really special about this gentleman here. At the age of 25, he found the bank OZK. He didn't have any prior titles. He didn't have any sort of royalty or any wealthy family or anything else like that. He managed to do it in the very true bank finance fashion and borrowed the money to by this bank and it's 41 years later and he's managed to take incredible market share from a lot of the other major banks and we're very happy to have him here today george i hope you're well where are you exactly i'm in little rock arkansas in the uh, atrium uh, fourth floor uh, balcony in the atrium of our new corporate headquarters that we're just moving people into over a 10-week period now so it's good to be with you thank you amir for having me yeah, absolutely. We're very happy to have you here. Uh, George, you know, before I, uh, once you agreed to do this talk, I reached out to several of your developers, some that you worked with in the past and some that you are currently working with. And one of the things that they all had in common about you and the bank uh, were that the bank OZK is misunderstood. What, what do they mean when they say that? Well, I don't think uh, Bank OZK is misunderstood by our customers or the counterparties that we work with uh, who are in mezzanine roles or preferred equity roles. I think uh, uh, people that we work with understand that we are very sophisticated and we're very knowledgeable and we're one of the leaders and most active participants across the country in the construction I'm, I'm, development I'm, industry. I want to interrupt you when you get uh, to pr -y. But I, I just want to understand why do you think that those developers think that uh, I understand you guys do great work and all of that, but why do you think that those developers all unanimously thought that you know the bank OZK is a mis misunderstood bank? What is it? Well, you know, uh, we've not uh, we've not done a good job probably of cultivating and managing uh, media relations. So uh, many people in the media particularly in uh, large metropolitan markets, uh, see a bank that is headquartered in Arkansas and has its real estate unit headquartered in Dallas, Texas, and somehow assumes, wow, can, can guys from Arkansas actually be smart enough to do the largest, most complex, sophisticated <laughs> transactions in New York and Miami and so forth. So the media grabs this, uh, and sometimes they're, they're fed that storyline by short sellers who would, would try to knock our stock down. And, you know, the media has written a lot of things about us, including – including your wonderful publication, written some things that were really not balanced and accurate because uh, you didn't get the full information. So I think well, the I people mean, who... I want to get the full information today. I mean, wonderful. I go back to the piece that we did that was you know from a year ago. But if you have anything to clear up about that piece, I'm, I'm happy to allow you to uh, talk about that now, or we could talk about the, what's present and what's going to happen in the future. Well, I think you and I have uh, had a number of conversations and are developing a good relationship that's based on real information and real understanding. So let's don't go back and dwell on the past, let's just work on, on telling the accurate facts and the true story. And I appreciate you having me on today. Thank you so much. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I just want to say on the record that as far as we were concerned, we thought it was a great story and we thought everything was in order. <laughs> and I know we spend a good deal of time with you and your people to make sure that everything was in order before it went to uh, print. Uh, George, you've become the go-to lender for a lot of the condo developers in New York, in Miami, in other gateway cities. 
And again, you said you're a bank from you know Arkansas, and there's so much competition. There's so much banking and financial competition in those cities already. How did you guys manage to get so much market share in those cities when there's so much other banking and so much competition? Well, I think we have a level of expertise and have uh, delivered to our customers a, uh, a consistent level of execution that uh, is, is worth our customers' attention and worth our customers' pain to do business with us. Uh, we're, we're a very low leverage lender. If we fully funded every loan in our RESG portfolio today, we would be at a 51% or so of cost and 41.5% of appraised value, those those data points for, are as of March 31. Uh, so other banks, a lot of- Do you think a lot of other banks are very far off from that? Yes, uh, uh, our customers can get higher leverage loans from others and they can probably get loans at lower rates uh, for, uh, from others, but our execution, our expertise, our, our reliability, the fact that we do not syndicate our credits, we hold everything on balance sheet, uh, and the fact that we're here in, in good times and bad times. You know, there wasn't a single day in 2008, 2009, 2010 when we weren't entertaining positively loan application requests for all types of products in every market we were doing business in at that time. And the same is true this year. There's not been one day this year and there won't be a day where we're not uh, open to loan applications for all types of product and all the markets we serve. And it's because- You're bullish, you're bullish on the current market. You, you still want to you, you still want to lend. You guys are still active. Is that what you're saying? Well, the, the current market is different than the market that we were in six months ago. But our business is, is really very simple, Amir, and you can try to complicate it, but, but we make loans to people who make money on projects that make sense. And uh, if you've got a, a strong sponsor who has a demonstrated track record and you know good liquidity and a good balance sheet and, and income generating capabilities and they consistently execute well and, and do a great job, and you've got a product, um, whether it's condos or office or, or retail or multi or industrial or, or last mile distribution or whatever, and and uh, you you do the supply demand metrics for that product and that market and that sub market and that micro market, and there's a clear compelling need for that product. Uh, demand for that product at the time it's delivered, then it's really a pretty that's, simple that's, business. That's, again, like you said, it seems like a very simple formula. And I, I, I can't imagine that other banks are not applying the same sort of formulas that you're talking about, uh, you know, right now. Well, I, I, think, I, think we, I think we execute better and I think we uh, do more homework and, and we gather more information. I'm glad you said that. One of the things that, the, you know, some of the developers said that, uh, you know, the administering of the loan from the bank of OZK is, uh, it's, abs it's absurdly tedious. I, I want to put that in quotations. Those were my words. They said it's absurdly tedious and that you guys sell it as discipline, uh, but, you know, they find it, uh, you know, it's sort of overdone, it's sort of the tediousness of the administering of the loan. Well, uh, you know, I've got four children, and, and I recall that uh, uh, when they were all growing up, they thought that uh, we had uh, too many rules and, and too much monitoring of their activities and too many restrictions and limitations on what they can do. And they've all grown up to be just wonderful adults, and I'm so proud of them. And they're all very appreciative of the uh, the parenting they had as children. Right. So and you and I, the same thing from the developers. I mean, if you're, you're, you're you know, like your children. But these are sophisticated adult individuals, but you know, a lender's role in in a relationship is to. Uh, uh, support the borrower, but also make sure that you're doing the right thing to make sure the borrower's not missing something. And uh, I can tell you a number of stories, and time doesn't allow today, where we have, have, have identified issues and identified problems and situations that sponsors were not aware of that ended up saving sponsors hundreds of thousands or even tens of millions of dollars 
in savings because we identified and pointed out an issue that they had not identified. And um, that's a big part of what we do. We bring value by being a very sophisticated partner. I understand that. And that's great. Uh, you know, I, I feel like every bank will say that they offer great service and they do all the things you said. But what I, what I want to ask you is that you, you said that you guys select good sponsors who do good work and you study the uh, macro market, the markets, the micro markets where these projects are going up. And that's how you decide on if it's going to work or not. What about in a situation where the entire market, like you, you were talking about the entire city, right? Entire market, or like right now, right? So where everything sort of, uh, you know, falls apart. The pieces don't fit the way they were supposed to fit or the way that you had planned. You're, you're a very smart guy. You finished law school in two years and you owned a bank by the time you were 25. But even you can't predict some of the stuff that's happened in the last uh, you know, few months, right? So uh, I'm not saying, look, nobody can be blamed for the pandemic. It, that's something that we're all dealing with together. But uh, you know, there are times where certain markets have to suffer, they suffer uh, you know, things that you cannot account for. And as a bank and as a chairman of the bank, as someone who's lending to these guys or to those markets, how do you deal with that? Well, you have to be disciplined and and assume that adverse things are going to happen. I mean, you can't just uh, say, wow, it's a great time now, and, and I'm going to assume a great time is going to continue. You have to be disciplined and, and you know, assume and, and underwrite and prepare for adversity because you never know when it's going to come and you never know from where it's going to come. So you mentioned, uh, and I'll correct you, I, I didn't graduate from law school in two years. I graduated top in my class from law school, but I did it in three years. I graduated from college in two years. So thank you for the, thank you for the recognition of that. I'll just clarify that. But you know, I've been doing this job uh, 41 plus years now. We've made money every year. We've never lost money. And most years as a bank, in 41 probably. Years, in 41 years, the bank OZK has never lost money. Never lost money. We've been profitable consistently for 41 years. And and uh, you mentioned the fact that as a 25-year-old, I borrowed essentially all the money to buy the bank. And that's true. And, you know, I knew that to make the transaction work, and to not have problems repaying that debt that we had to perform in an amazingly consistent and disciplined manner and that we had no room for a lot of errors or any significant errors. So uh, from literally the day one uh, of my term as chairman and CEO of Bank OZK and its predecessor institutions, uh, we have followed a very disciplined practice. So in the last, uh, we've been a public company now 22 years. In that 22 years, we've not had one single year where our net charge-off ratio is equaled or exceeded the industry's average. We beat the industry every year. And on average, we beat the industry by 65%. We've had a loss ratio over 22 years that is 35% of the industry's loss ratio. And, you know, we've had some pretty significant uh, economic downturns, certainly the Great Recession being one of them in that uh, 22 uh, year I'm, period of I'm time. I'm glad you brought up the Great Recession because the, after the Great Recession is when the back OCK actually really came into these gateway markets. Before that, you were, you know, you were sort of a more, more known as a regional bank, you know, in the Midwest. And at, you, you saw an opportunity, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, you know, it was very clear because it was in 2012, you came into New York, 2015, you went into Miami, you hit those markets at the time when there was a lot of appetite for money and for building and for projects, you hit them at a good time. So, uh, I mean, that allowed you to build up a tremendous amount of market share. But wh why didn't you guys come into those cities uh, prior to prior to the Great Recession or prior to? Well, you know, uh, when I when I purchased controlling interest to the bank in 1979, it was a 28 million dollar bank in total assets. So it was a tiny little bank, and uh, we we grew quickly, but we grew primarily within Arkansas, and then. Uh, uh, located a loan production office in Charlotte, North Carolina, and then 
a branch in a loan production office in uh, Texas. Okay. And uh, that loan production office in Texas was really designed to be our real estate specialties group, uh, which has been in operation now for um, 17 plus years. And, did and you, that's the you know, that office. Did you guys seek out the developers or did the developers seek you guys out? Uh, we saw the developers and, and uh, we really focused on Texas developers first because the office was in Texas. And, you know, in, in our view as a very small company, then uh, Austin, uh, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio were were uh, big markets and right. transactions for big transactions there. But it's a different beast than we coming to New York and the stuff that you guys invested in in New York and in Miami. I mean, you have a five hundred fifty million dollar loan at for one project in Miami. That's a significant loan for a bank. Yeah. yeah, and we have a six hundred and sixty million dollar loan in Tampa on a on a project. Uh, that we're extremely proud of. That's actually 11 buildings all in one credit structure. Um, George, a, a lot of the other lenders who are in the same, sort of in the same lending practice as you are, they wouldn't take uh, roughly 2% of their uh, you know, assets and invest it into a loan. Uh, but you guys are doing that. That's a very big risk for you guys. Well, I don't think it is a big risk, Mayor, and I, and I understand the you know the uh, principles of diversification and and uh, not having too many eggs in one basket. I mean, I understand that, but the the reality is, uh, the larger the project, the better the sponsorship, the uh, the 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 more experience and ability and background the sponsor is typically going to have in a large transaction, and the more capital and liquidity they are going to have accumulated. And you can do a large transaction like that at lower leverage than you can do a transaction that's uh, half that size or a tenth that size. Uh, and you have a better real estate asset. You know, uh, three of our guiding principles and what we do is to deal with really quality, well-heeled sponsors or if the sponsor is is not deeply experienced have prep equity or mass lenders in there that are in a risk position that are going to take I, I risk before so I, in the sponsors and you know you know we cover real estate 24 uh, 7 and you see amazing sponsors that uh, make fatal flaws or you know fall into yeah. bad times you, and, you and, do and, th and that's exactly why you also one of the other principles of you have a great asset because if a sponsor can't deliver and can't execute we want to have a great asset asset that you know is really going to be in in high demand and high value and and readily marketable and then the other principle is to have very low leverage and as i mentioned you know our portfolio at march 31 the last time we published information on it we were 51 percent of the cost weighted average basis on our projects and 41 and a half percent of appraised value so if you're you know in the market that you're in today some product types take hotels well, hotel values may have degraded 20% plus or minus as a result of the uh, disruption in the travel and hospitality industry. So if you're at 70% loan to value, like some lenders are, and values degrade 20%, you're pretty close to the edge there. But if you're just if you're 30, 40, and 50 percent loan to value like we are, you're, you're, uh, 40, you're, you're yeah. talking to me like I'm a banker. Unfortunately, I'm not. Uh, I, I have a nicer place. But uh, so you're throwing a lot of numbers there. But I, I just want to keep things uh, somewhat general so that everybody who's uh, watching can follow us. And at the end of the day, you guys are a bank, right? And uh, so you're saying to take over an asset that's you know you have a 660 million dollar loan into. It's not what you guys do, and I. You don't have the experience uh, managing a project that's, uh, that you, a project that size that you would have to take over. I mean, have you been in those situations before? Has has the bank been in those situations before where they have to take over an asset, finish it, or manage it, or market it, or any of that stuff? Yes, we have, and you know, I mean, that's part of lending money. That uh, not every loan works, and you need to be prepared and have the uh, have the bandwidth and the capability to uh, to do that. And yes, if a, if a sponsor is not going to perform or not going to behave, 
in an appropriate manner. We have no uh, reservations about taking over the assets and completing it if it's not completed, selling it out if it's not uh, under contract to be sold, or operating it. And, you know, in my 41 years, we've operated hotels, we've operated fitness centers, uh, we have uh, uh, finished lot developments and sold them out and built them out with uh, vertical structures on them. And, you know, we've done all sorts of things successfully to uh, manage assets that became problem assets. That's certainly not our preference and probably no lender's preference, but we're not shy about it and have no reservation about uh, doing it. Right. Let me say this. If you're, if you're a lender and you're not willing to do that, then you're in a situation where your uh, borrowers can push you around if there's a problem. And uh, we're, streets, we're not going to allow that. If you if you lend on the streets and they don't pay, you got to go out there and beat them. You know, you got to beat it out of them and get it back somehow. But uh, well, I, I wouldn't go quite that far. Maybe you shouldn't be a lender if you're going to beat it out of them. But stick with what you know here. <laughs> Sounds good. There is, you know, I want to go back to uh, what we were talking about earlier. Like, you know, somebody like uh, Wells Fargo, uh, they wouldn't take, you know, two percent of their assets and invest it with, uh, and, you know, in a single project. But you guys feel comfortable in doing that. I'm, I'm getting, you know, these are we're talking about different sort of uh, and, and dollar amounts here. But, yes, uh, we are. But, but, uh, but still, <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's a risk that you're willing to make, but the other banks aren't willing to make. That's because you're so hands on with so many of the loans. Where in those some of those banks, they are, you know, the the chief is not necessarily so hands on with the big loans. Well, I think I think that is certainly uh, one factor, um, and and you know. There, there's no loan that we make above ten million dollars that I don't approve, and a loan committee in our bank doesn't approve a loan committee of our board of directors. So uh, there is high level of engagement, and you know I was on the road last year 153 days. I think I was in 173 different. Uh, cities on business last year and I know a lot of our customers and uh, you know the personal knowledge the personal relationship the personal uh, experience of being in the market walking a project walking a neighborhood around a project that is a uh, that's a valuable thing and um, you know big bank CEOs and high level executives don't do that very much. They probably do it some, but not a lot. And I do it a lot. Right. So our, our experience, our knowledge, our, our commitment to the business gives us a comfort level to do that. And I would much rather have, you know, a $650 million loan that is a great loan to a great, great sponsor on a great, great project that, you know, 38% loan to cost and 35% loan to appraised value than to have 10 $65 million loans to average sponsors on average projects at 70% leverage, which is what most banks would do instead of doing the one great loan. Has your attitude changed about loan to cost in just in the last uh, several months? No, not really. Uh, you know, there's a right loan to cost on every transaction, and that seems to keep us gravitating somewhere around fifty uh, percent uh, of uh, cost on average, more or less. Yeah. And then that, you know, you guys have made a lot of loans in the last uh, year and prior to that, but the, the loan to value has uh, definitely changed. Don't you feel that a lot of assets have changed in terms of value? And what does that mean for those uh, loans now? Yeah, uh, assets have changed in value. And, you know, interestingly, uh, I was looking at a report a, a week or so ago of all the appraisals that we've gotten this quarter new appraisals that, that certainly take into account uh, COVID-19 situation. And these numbers are not e exact, but in general terms, about 20% of those loans had a uh, less than a 5% change in their loan to value. And that's about just 40 percent. Just five percent. Yeah. That's, that's 20, yeah, yeah, very small. You know, they were essentially the same value, plus or minus 5% that they were when they were last appraised. Uh, about 40% had higher loan to values and about 40% had lower loan to values. And uh, a lot of our projects actually appraised for a higher value and a lower loan to value than when they were originated a year or two or three years ago. 
and that's because the sponsors have done a fabulous job creating value. They've improved the entitlements or uh, increased the uh, FAR allocation for the property or uh, delivered leases that were uh, at a higher rental rate than uh, what was underwritten and what the appraisal had originally assumed or achieved sales prices that were higher than the original appraisal. And about uh, an equal number of loans had gone up and loaned the value and down in value. And as you probably would suspect, the uh, majority of the loans that, that actually uh, have a higher loan to value and a lower value now are hotel loans, hospitality loans. But you guys are still, lo- you're still lending to the hotel? Well, we are. Uh, for the right project, we're still out there and we would still make loans. And, you know, again, our weighted average loan to value in our real estate specialties group hospitality portfolio at March 31 was 40%. Yeah. So if, if that loan to value changes 15 or 20 or 25%, which is most of them have been between uh, 10 and 20 percent uh, that we've gotten reappraised. But if it changes 15 or 20, you know, you're still at 60 percent. And that is under where most lenders are underwriting hotel loans to start with. So the uh, very low leverage that we do transactions uh, gives us a huge margin and a huge cushion to absorb events like this pandemic or the Great Recession and still have viable projects with with substantial um, equity in them. Well, let me ask you, like one of the things that we talk about all the time and it's coming up constantly is this whole idea of uh, commercial office space and not having the same value as it did. I know you guys don't have that many loans to commercial buildings. You have four in New York City, I believe. But uh, in general, what's your attitude about that? Like the the other day when we spoke, it seemed like uh, people in Arkansas are just uh, sort of uh, going about it. And you're in your office, which is great. I haven't been to my office in a long time. And and maybe I'm in a bubble here in New York City and not realizing it. But uh, the thing that keeps coming up is that people don't have to have their employees, at least not all of them, in their office space. The same way that in the 90s, the sort of call centers moved out of, you know, uh, the actual centers and moved to North Carolina and Minneapolis and other places where they were more affordable. And the same thing is gonna happen to certain departments in different companies where people are like, well, I don't need my copywriter inside my office in New York City. They could be, you know, in Arkansas or they could be in North Carolina. And uh, what's what's your attitude about that? How do you feel about lending to commercial today? Well, uh, first, I would tell you that things always change. You know, if if you go back a decade in the office market, you know, uh, conventional office in the traditional sense was was you know all the rage, and and uh, that's what people were building and developing. And you know, over the last decade, you've had this uh, increasing uh, movement toward uh, you know more creative office, more collaborative spaces, more open office, more shared space and so forth and you know all that's gained a lot of traction and it's changed the way we underwrite projects and changed the way we look at projects and we've done more uh, creative uh, and less uh, traditional I think you're going to see that sort of reverse in in terms of if you have a very solid sponsor and you get a very major commercial office landlord who comes to you and says they want to do a refi of their building on six what, what would your general response be? I mean, you, you said earlier, you said you're a big believer in the sponsor and that's the key thing that if you have a great sponsor, if you have a great sort of a location in, in a great market, then it's, you know, that's like 50, 70% of the way there. Right now, a major landlord, commercial landlord came to you and said, Hey, I need to uh, refinance uh, my uh, 1220 for a billion and a half dollars. What would your attitude be about that? Well, uh, first, that's not going to happen because 99% of our real estate specialties book is construction and development lending. And we, we do almost no permanent lending. Now, we would love to have the permanent loan on every loan we develop. But the truth is that a sponsor is going to get a loan that is 150 to 250% of our loan amount when they go to the permanent loan market. So we're not going to loan anybody that much money on a project. So we're not going to be 
in the uh, in the long term lending position. Just they're going to be they're going to lending to an office. Uh, you know. I know, but it's just not. It's a it's a hypothetical question that's really not going to happen. Um, and uh, um, you know, a, a permanent lender is going to be at a lower rate. They're going to be a fixed rate loan. All of our construction loans are variable rate with floors, and and they've all got a construction loan rate. So a sponsor is going to want higher leverage fixed rate, longer term, and uh, uh, lower rate than what we'll do on the construction line. But um, I had a view of it. What's your general view on the office market in general? In, in term, in, well, I, here, here uh, I'll, I'll answer that. I'm glad to answer that. And it's a great question. Uh, but I think office is not in any way dead. And you've seen this in the last few weeks. If, if you know, you've been reading your own publication there, there have been some pretty nice leases signed in New York on office space in the last 30 days. Uh, uh, and it tells I you that, there's, out that there have been a few that have been canceled as well. Well, that's true too. But but you've got people leasing space, and and some of them have been some pretty big, noteworthy uh, leases that that I've read about. So um, I think you're going to have a need for space now. Clearly, uh, the uh, pandemic has made folks think more um, uh, positively toward working remotely, and made folks who thought they couldn't work remotely realize, wow, they can if they're forced to do so. And some of them have even decided they they like it. But I think what you're going to see happen over the next couple of years is is in the short term, you're going to have a, a, a greater embrace of working remotely. In the longer term, I think a lot of companies are going to realize that they're losing some of the collaboration and some of the esprit de corps and some of the benefits of having team together and that trend, that pendulum will swing back the other way. The other thing that affects space demand is I think you're going to see uh, a desire for more separation and more social distancing in the uh, office environment. Which will so, uh, require people to lease more space that they have to pay for, which in turn will require landlords to sort of lower their prices because if you have to get, if you need a 10,000 square feet for a hundred people and now you need 20,000 square feet, that cost is going to come from someone, right? Someone's going to have to pay for that price. Well, they, you know, the landlord, if, if everybody needs more space for less people, the landlords are not going to lower their rent. They're going to raise their rent because there's going to be more demand, not, not less. So uh, whether they have to raise rents or lower rents is going to be a function of, of supply and demand. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, I'm I'm comfortable. The market will work that out on a market by market basis. But I do think I do think there's going to be a change in what office is going to be in the highest demand. Uh, and I think there'll be you know a pendulum that'll swing back and forth on uh, how remotely we work and how much we work in the office, and you know how far that pendulum swings one way or the other, and how far it swings back will depend on you know, how long this COVID-19 pandemic exists? Is there a, a lingering fear of it? Are there other sort of things, you know, in the next few years that create similar fears? Uh, you know, no one knows all that. All the COVID did was that sort of catapult this whole work from home thing into action, right? So like all of a sudden people realize that they can actually do it. They can work from home. And look, yeah. we've been doing it for several months and uh, we've managed to sort of, uh, you know, work through it, which is great. And I just don't know how long it's, you know, how long it can be sustainable for. It. So that's, that's my big question too, that nobody has to answer. Uh, I wanna well, I'll, t- I'll tell you my experience. You know, I worked from home for uh, 80 something days and, uh, uh, you know, did so very effectively and, and worked 10 or 12 hours every day. And every night after I finished working, I made a list of everything I wanted to accomplish the next day. And, you know, I was on uh, WebEx or Zoom or conference calls, you know, pretty much continuously minute by minute uh, in 15 or 30 minute time slots all day long. And I got everything done and we were very efficient. But when I realized uh, I was in Dallas last week for three days, my first trip in three months at our RESG office in Dallas. And and I moved two weeks ago into our new headquarters where we have a skeletal uh, part of our team now and, and more will come over time. But uh, what I realized is 
what I was missing was the the peripheral information that I got when I had a conversation with a guy at the coffee pot and he, he would say to me, you know, I've been meaning to tell you about this and I just haven't seen you and I want to update you on this. And I say, wow, I'm really glad, you know, really need to know that. I'm glad you told me or, you know, you, yeah, you yeah, there's uh, gonna be compromises on both sides, right? Like you, you ride an elevator and I think companies are going to say, wow, you know, we're, we're doing okay. We've been social distancing and working remotely for three or four months and this is going to work and we can keep doing that. But the longer they go, the more they're going to realize they're losing that edge. And, you know, the things, the the information flow and the collaboration and the, the esprit de corps, the building of team that make a company great as opposed to good yeah. are factors that largely derive from personal interaction and close communication and informal interaction and communication. And George, we're almost running out of time. I want to get these uh, last questions in. What's uh, been the appetite for condo development? H- have you been getting people reaching out to you uh, in, in the markets that you were in, in New York, Miami? What's been the appetite from those people? I, I don't uh, know that we've seen a condo loan application in uh, New York in the last 30 days, but we closed uh, two uh, condo projects uh, in Miami and and closed on a land deal um, uh, that will evolve pretty quickly, I think, in the vertical construction of a major condo project. Is developer you worked with in the past, or is, is this a new sponsor? Uh, it's a mix. Uh, some some past and some new, and, and one deal we've uh, just closed the uh, – uh, it's a joint sponsorship, and part of that sponsorship is a new relationship, and part of it's someone we've done business with. This stuff about inventory in Miami, and I, I do understand that in the last couple of months, the whole attitude about Miami condos have really changed. I mean, everybody I'm talking to, especially in the tri-state area, is looking to buy and move to Miami. <laughs> the interest there has gone up a lot uh, because of COVID, and the, you know, all the looting and protests here in New York, uh, you know, on top of it, uh, didn't help. But um, so you are you are uh, you are seeing deals get done in Miami for condo development even now, even in this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're doing them. And, and um, you know, we up through the end of last year, we had closed 22 uh, major condo construction projects in Miami in this cycle. And we were down to, I think, three or four of those projects still on the books at the end of the year, and a couple of them have paid off this year. And, you know, we've taken a lot of heat in, in uh, your publication and others over the last several years about our exposure to Miami condos. And our constant answer to that is, guys, do the math. Mm-hmm. Look at the supply, look at the demand, look at the end migration, look at the job creation, look at the population formation in South Florida, and look at how long it takes. You know, it takes four to five years to incubate and, and bring to market a new condo project in Miami. Look at the inventory and what's happening to the inventory and what's happening to the supply demand. And I don't care whether you're on Sunny Isles or, or Brickell or or you know any other sub market micro market there if you do the math uh right. you, you could you see can, you could see three or four years ago that there was going to be a shortage of supply so we don't do a lot of math we just cover what the math that you guys do but uh, uh, the math that you do what does it say about new york city uh, this says there are a lot of condos in New York City and, you know, you've got people moving out of New York City instead of moving into New York City. And it will take a while to uh, absorb that supply, I think. So what happens? Uh, and, and, you know, I, I will tell you that, you know, the math is to say the math about New York City says this is a big generalization because, you know, there are uh, a dozen plus distinct micro markets in Manhattan alone and in Brooklyn and Long Island City and Queens and they're all different and they're sub markets and micro markets within those sub markets. So and you know, even within a micro market, you know, are you talking about the the building that's on the corner of the block with views of the park? Are you talking about the mid block building or the building that's on the corner on the other end but they got water views but they screwed up the windows and Right. You know, they, they destroyed the value by not putting in the right window. It, 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 you've got to really look at the details. And I think 
our company is a company that really looks at studies and understands the details and and makes a lot of really good decisions about what to finance, who to finance it for, and how to structure that financing and how much leverage is super safe even in a stress scenario. Do you think one of the things that gives you guys an edge and gives you a lot of control is that you don't syndicate your loans? You know, I think syndication is is uh, um, a uh, overvalued uh, practice, and and I understand that you know if if you don't do the kind of detailed work and analytics and study we do, you don't want to hold a three hundred million dollar loan. So syndicating a three hundred million dollar loan into ten thirty million dollar pieces averages out your risk but our view is we really want to do the analytics we want to do the homework we really under want to understand the sponsor and the concentration if we do all that work and we really understand what we've got uh, doesn't doesn't bother us and clearly it's it's beneficial to our customers i mean our customers realize every time they take a syndicated loan term sheet and move toward closing they're going to have multiple law firms they're going to have multiple lenders they're going to have a lot of issues they're going to have a lot more cost and with someone with a reputation for execution and closing and delivering what we quote uh, you know sponsors are much more comfortable in doing business with us knowing we're not going to syndicate credit well, George, uh, thank you so much. Thanks for spending your afternoon with us. Uh, to uh, our viewers, uh, please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe to the Real Deals uh, paywall and support us so we can continue to bring enlightening interviews like this one uh, to you on a regular basis. George, thank you so much. Your office looks beautiful. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Good luck with uh, the moving in and everything else. And uh, I hope to see you soon. Thank you, Amir. I appreciate you having me. I look forward to hosting you in Little Rock and uh, seeing you in uh, New York in the next uh, month or so. I'm planning a trip up there. Good, good. I'll see you there. Thank Cheers. you so much.